in the room. So uh, please remember, um, uh, only turn your mic on, please, uh, when you're speaking. Um, and please only use the chat um, for technical matters, because um, I haven't got access um, to the chat. Um, uh, first agenda item um, is apologies for absence. So um, uh, coming up to Easter, quite a lot of people are away. So I've had apologies for absence from Jackie Byrne, um, the borough commander, James Conway, uh, Dr. Husbands, Paul Senior, Shilpa Shah, um, Dr. Wenerden, and Helen Woodland. And then we've had apologies for lateness uh, from Andreas, but you're here, well done, good work. Um, and uh, Councillor Bramble and uh, Joya Desar, who will be joining Brighton 10 um, at four o'clock. Uh, can I just remind you to make sure your declarations of interest are up to date, please? Um, our first item is item four, the minutes um, of the previous meeting, which are laid out for us on pages seven to 17. Um, any corrections on page seven from anyone? Eight, nine, 10, 11. You can see the way this is going. 12. <laughs> and the rest of the minutes? No. Okay, great. So I will sign those as um, a true record. Um, We've had no uh, questions from the public notified to us. We do encourage questions from the public. Do please remind um, all your organizations um, that we have a health and wellbeing board, that especially if someone has got um, a strategic question, especially about the wider determinants of health, we want to hear from them. Um, we want to be able to um, outline the approach that we as a system are taking to the matters that they might have um, concerns about. Um, that brings us on to item six, um, which is our community voice item. Um, welcome, Sally from Health Watch Hackney. Um, um, and you've done a really good and interesting piece of work, thank you, um, on the challenges faced by our LGBTQIA plus community, um, especially around accessing healthcare and, and council consultations and how they're treated by partners in general. So over to you, Sally. Absolutely, and thank you for having us along today. This, this piece of work, we wanted to look at it because we felt we felt we've been we've been hearing anecdotally as, as we talk to residents about about this issue, particularly around trust from the LGBTQIA plus community, trust in services, trust in, in particularly access to clinical services, mental health services, and we felt like. We're hearing this and we feel like we know we know this, but we want to explore it in a bit more depth. And I guess then we wanted to bring it here today to make sure that what we feel we know that's quite quite commonly known and thought about in terms of commissioning and policy. Uh, we started off we had a public forum just to kind of gauge whether we were in the right kind of area. And from there we wanted to go really, really in depth and do some qualitative work. We held a focus group. We had 15 attendees, but we were quite careful in selecting people who are able to speak on their own behalf as members of the community, but also were either through their professional capacity, working either in the BCS or within the statutory sector in health and care, able to talk on behalf of lots of residents that are members of the community. And we explored a few issues and things, things that came up really the things that leapt out at us and i think it's important um i'm, I'm going to talk very very briefly through it but um, i think it's important to go away and read the report if you haven't had a chance to already because what we want to share is all those direct quotes that are in that report that's what we want you to, we want you to hear the voice of people that are experiencing this to help help you understand so we, we, we heard a lot about the impact of a lack of sensitivity from healthcare professionals and staff and it could be interpreted as discriminatory. We feel that from a lot of what we've heard, it often it's, it's not a deliberate discrimination. We, we really feel it's, it's stemming from a lack of understanding or a lack of education, but the end result is the same. Um, if, for, for example, we heard, we've heard and we've heard this before, um, people going into GP practices and perhaps the receptionist is referring to them by their, their dead name because that's what it shows on their records. And that lack of understanding that actually immediately, as soon as that person's walked into a room, you've broken their, their trust, they don't want to come back. 
and we strongly feel that this is contributing to people from the LGBTQIA plus community presenting more at crisis point and engaging much less with that preventative work because once that trust is broken what we're hearing from people is they don't want to go back they don't want to want to go go in and engage with people um, we've heard that the, these experiences are really 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 pre pre prevalent and there's some quotes in the report thinking about how that's caused them to disengage and not want to come along to services um, and particularly around mental health and if you speak, speaking of health, to, to, to try and understand a bit more of the data around this, that if members of the LGBTQIA plus community are presenting far more at crisis point than engaging at that um, lower level of mental health and get to, getting the interventions, from what we're understanding, that's coming from a lack of in the system. What we, um, so jumping to, it, to our, our recommendations, the report recommends thinking about training programs for healthcare staff, focusing on the LGBTQA plus community awareness, sensitivity and including, and we're thinking including modules on the importance of respecting gender identities, understanding the concept of the chosen family that came across as very, very important to us because we, we know the impact of, of isolation um, and avoiding invasive questioning. This particularly came up, I'll give you an example, um, we heard from a lady that um, went in for a smear test and she felt that because she was a lesbian, she was asked some really quite inappropriate and intrusive questions that had nothing in her mind to do with the very, very day-to-day -day normal procedures she was having. And the result of that was that lady doesn't want to go back, doesn't want to go back for a repeat smear test, doesn't want, want to engage. So really thinking about are the questions I'm asking appropriate? Is this what it, what needs needs to be done at this point? So really, the, the biggest emphasis I think that's coming out of this report is education and understanding. We heard quite a lot as well about the need for safe spaces. We heard from the community that a lot of the spaces which the LGBT community have historically used, often based around kind of the nighttime economy or alcohol and actually safe, sober spaces where people can come together, be themselves in a trusted environment. And there's there's a, a lack of, and I wonder if this is something the council can think about, the actually physical spaces being provided. There's members of the community who can come forward and use those spaces if the spaces are provided. So that is, that's a strong recommendation. Um, and we also heard some quite interesting stuff about risk assessments, whether it's it's clinical risk assess assessments or whether this can be thought about when we're thinking about policies and things like that as well, that the needs of this community are different. And is that being thought about? Is the same risk assessment being applied just across the board in a one size fits all? Or are, are there specific needs being thought about? Um, I really urge you to, to go away and read the direct quotes. Um, because I think it's quite emotive when you listen to what the community's telling us. But we wanted to bring it here today because we think we can do this work with directly with services and with voluntary sector that are working directly with the community. But when it comes to policy making, the bigger picture and commissioning, can these things be put in at procurement level? You know, to think about when we're commissioning a service, making sure right from the get go, have we thought about the needs of this community? How, how are they being catered for? Is that education piece put in right from the start rather than being a kind of an afterthought? So these, these are kind of the thoughts we're, we're bringing to you. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there because I think it's all in the report. And um, obviously, any questions, Well, um, Thank you very much in, uh, indeed, Sally. Can I just check your time frame? This, was this part of the consultation on our equality plan? Yes, this, yeah. this fed, fed in, into which so 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 a, a lot of, a lot of what's in here has actually influenced what we passed at full council. Um, for those of you on screen, um, uh, Sonia Khan, head of policy, is is giving very reassuring nods to to that statement, um, and uh, Councillor Williams as well. So um, I'm glad that that informed um, what we. But there's always, I think, the lesson is there's always more to be done, um, isn't it? And there are always um, individual. Um, cases where you can uh, uh, you can take further learning. Um, uh, anybody want to make um, any specific points? I had I had I'll start sort of chair's privilege with 
one comment. I'd love to have just seen a little summation of the census data because sexual orientation was included in the census for the first time um, in 2021. Um, and, you know, it's, it's very relevant to us um, because uh, um, in terms of sexual orientation, I think we've got, we're the fifth most diverse bar rate in London. Um, um, I've, I've, uh, I, I, Googled, I Googled it. I Googled it this morning. Um, and actually, um, over over one percent of our population in Hackney have a gender identity um, that is different to the sex that was assigned to them at their at their birth. So, actually, I think that's those stats. Um, I think would really have helped at the beginning of the report because an organisation reading it will go, "Oh, hold on." So, one in a hundred of every adult who comes um, into my door um, is. Um, trans or might identify as trans or, or non-binary and and to be able to as an organization recognize that I think is um, is really important and actually speaks to some of your recommendations in the report I would say mm, that, that's really helpful actually and we will definitely take take that away and I think we may look at adding that because I think often when we, when we speak to, to, to services there's a sense that well this is a very small number of people we talk about but actually when you put it in those terms it oh. helps people to understand no this is this is really even if it's a small number i think it would still be important but it is it is much bigger number than people. thank you yeah um so the um I, I'd, I'd like to hear comments from people on the recommendations and how easy they think um for their own organizations um their own sphere of influence um, they are to implement. Do you want to just quickly talk us through, Sally, and then I'll, I'll, I'll take hands on perhaps specific ones um, as you've gone through them. Uh, yes, I, I will. I've <coughs> taken some of, the, some of the key recommendations because, because I think that there'll be too much detail otherwise. Really, the recommendations around training, and I guess for you guys, it's thinking about how widely can, can we use these recommendations. So, training programs for healthcare staff focusing on LGBTQIA plus awareness, sensitivity, and inclusion. And just to add, I don't think that needs to just be restricted to healthcare staff at all. Let's just have a big focus of this report. Um, in that training, including modules on the importance of respecting gender identity, understanding the chosen family and avoiding invasive questioning and educating healthcare providers on the diversity and complexities within the LGBTQIA plus community, including issues relating to intersectionality, gender identity and sexual orientation. I think that's really important because it, it can be just an umbrella term, LGBTQIA plus, but understanding that that actually covers a lot of different yeah. groups within that. So that, that speaks to the education piece. Um, there were further recommendations uh, particularly around um, the risk evaluations, which I, which I think is, is an interesting one, and I don't know how it would be for organisations to implement, but thinking about do we need to think about safeguarding and risk in a different way when we're working with this group? And then the recommendations around the establishment of safe spaces, sober, secure, safe spaces where people can come in and spend time, peer support, be themselves. Those are the key ones that jumped out for me. Yeah, thank you. I think there's definitely something, an action to take away for uh, myself on Cabinet Procurement and Insourcing Committee, mm -hmm. um, is to check that, you know, where appropriate um, on the contracts that we procure, uh, we're making, um, it's in there at the moment, but it's not, it's not out there um, in, a, in a big way, mm -hmm. and, and checking on how inclusive and how aware of this community um, contract advice. How explicit that is yes. in the process. Yes, sir. Uh, Chris, yeah. So thank you very much for the report. And <clears throat> this clearly echoes a lot of what's in the council's strategy, which has been approved. And I think there was a data monitoring part of that strategy, which is really important. And I think what we are looking at is trust and confidence from both residents to access services, to disclose sexual or gender identity and also for staff as well it's so important that we have got lots of staff who identify as lgbtqia plus and whether they um, choose to be you know, fully out at work is obviously uh, important in terms of whether they've got trust and confidence i think there isn't sometimes in this report and i think it comes through a little bit is that people often find that 
some of the questions that we might want to be asking to demonstrate that our services are open, accessible, then sometimes come across as being heavy handed and over intrusive. And that's the sort of the trust and the confidence of understanding why are you asking somebody about their sexual orientation if they're accessing the library services? It may not be immediately obvious, but if you do have something that explains why, then people can then understand, oh, you actually do understand that it may not be feel safe for me at the moment to identify as a minority, but at the same time, actually, as an organisation providing services, it can be important sometimes for us to know. And, and I think the, the potential for us as the survey, the census has done, is to use other sources of information to see whether we've got open, accessible, trusted and uh, services is, is important. Um, I think it, it is it is hopefully something that we can try and join up across all of the public sector and voluntary sector services because I think that tell us tell your information once is is important rather than each time you access a service you are sometimes filling out what people say reams of information that you've already given more than one. So I think trying to get a standard way of, of recording data, explaining why it's going to be important. Um, we've also got a, a, a um, London-wide approach to ending discrimination for people living with HIV. And obviously not everybody who lives with HIV is LGBTQIA+, but quite often the discrimination people experience is because of homophobia, transphobia, as well as um, phobia around HIV. But I think we would be planning to bring that charter to the Health and Wellbeing Board in some point in the future to see whether City and Hackney would want to be one of the first local authorities to sign up to the anti-stigma charter. But I think, as Councillor Kennedy has indicated, if we look with our commissioning it's about you know, what do we say, what do we do in terms of our recording, and then be mindful of what's in our council strategy, I think that would help inform the partnership approach to, to um, improving trust and confidence in, in um, services being provided by and for LGBTQIA plus people. Yeah, brilliant, thank you. Oh, Councillor oh, Williams. Yes, yeah, so all I wanted to say is that's really positive and, and thank you very much for um, the report uh, and the survey for participating in the development of our equalities approach as well. Um, and thank you for bringing the report here today. Um, we have, and um, thank you to Sonny and Sonny's team um, that have led on the development of our, uh, our uh, equality strategy and our LGBTQ framework. Uh, really significantly important piece of work not least because of what you have said um, in terms of our staff diversity, but also our community diversity, as, as um, Councillor Kennedy has mentioned. Um, the more that we can do, I think, as a council um, and as commissioners uh, and commission partners, I think it would be incredibly important. Anyone who has experienced any kind of exclusion from uh, health and medical services will understand the significance of this um so, so i think that, that this piece of work is hugely hugely important and builds on um previous work by the scrutiny commission health and well-being no health in Hackney scrutiny, yeah. scrutiny commission as well so it does feel like the council and all partners um, are working together with a single aim and objective so incredibly important i just wanted to put that on the record thank you Yes, and there are a few recommendations from scrutiny, from Health and Acne, that I think are still pending. Um, and the Chief Medical Officer for North East London ICB did, has, did express some interest in taking it forward. And I think there was one around um, strength in the primary care practice around LGBTQIA+. Um, so I think Paul was quite keen on taking that forward. And I'm, I'm looking to our colleagues over. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah, I'm aware of that. Yeah. I, I think that would be something, it has been very successful because it is that it speaks to the trust and confidence of, of people um, being able to access services. And sometimes it does feel a shame that you have to sort of, you know, put up something that says people are welcome. But often it then does become something that people can point to and say, oh, I see you have got this sign or you are in practice that is you know, designated as LGBTQIA plus friendly. I mean, all, obviously we want all of our primary care to be that, but I think that that was one of the um, 
conversations at scrutiny that I think would be good to follow up on. Yeah. I see notes being taken. With the evening red. <laughs> That's correct, Andreas. Thank you. Um, one thing I wanted to say: there's a suggestion. One of the vox pops is, um, is says we should have a Hackney Pride. Um, I, I did want to remind everyone that we have a very um, big Hackney Council presence at, um, at the London Pride March um, every year, and that we've hosted Black Pride for the last two years um, in Hackney, um, in my ward. Uh, we have LGBTQIA plus cultural grants awards um, and an LGBTQIA plus um, history month yes. and literature month. So um, while we... Yes, we will be marking... Uh, we will. Trent, sorry. Uh, Councillor um, Williams is about to, about to add to that list. Sorry. Um, Trans Day of Visibility um, is coming up at the end of the month. So will be marked with that as well. And I think I'm right in saying that as an employer, we score very highly on um, LGBTQI friendly plus, don't we? Uh, when staff surveys are done. Is that right? Uh, the, rec the results of that coming out, I'm trying to quickly wrap my brain on what the most recent responses have said, but I'll have to come back to you on the detail, Councillor Kennedy, and, and let you... Yeah, we've had the previous one, but we, we haven't been able to drill down yet for this year's we haven't got that from the data, but previously you're right, when you look at equality groups, there is a high group, but of course, I was caveat with that, and saying that you can't, you know, it's like any equality group, you have to look at all of the different groups. Yeah because the more positive result might mask some groups who are very small populations, but it's going to be um, dissatisfied if you, when you look at the global whole of LGBTQIA. Yeah, yeah, uh, granted. And we always, as you quite rightly say in your report, have to be aware of um, intersectionalities. Um, Jess, online. Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Lubin, Director of Health Transformation at Hackney CVS. Um, thank you very much for the report. I found it really interesting. I wanted to raise um, a potential gap for the future um, around this community, which is that the uh, VCS SIG special interest group that ha we have been running um, and started a few years ago is uh, having its last meeting next week. That is because the VCS enabler, which is funded by the health and care system through the ICB, has had its funding cut by 20, around 20 to 30%. Um, so we're having to close down a number of our special interest groups and that includes the LGBTQIA SIG. Um, the SIG has been fundamental in supporting the delivery or the development of the uh, strategy that was developed by Hackney Council um, and has been a co-production partner throughout. Um, and I think that this is going to be um, a gap there is, uh, there are plans to, and we are supporting a community member to develop their own special interest group or forum. Um, however, there is no funding for this currently, and so uh, we are. Um, there's still a risk, or there is a significant risk here, um, and we've highlighted the needs of this community and how important it is specifically for Hackney. So I wanted to have that down in in writing and see if there's any opportunity um, for uh, to fill this gap in the future. Many thanks. Thanks to Jess. Um, Councillor Williams on that. Thank you, Jess. That's really helpful. Um, and uh, of course, one of the further risks um, is even where we do set up a forum, I think it will need to um, be carefully considered um, in terms of membership. And given the comments that you've made about intersectionality here and the, the various um, parts of the LGBTQIA community, how it, the risk, there is a risk that it could be dominated by one or more other parts of that community. So making progress for those who are the most marginalised could still present a significant risk. I, I think it's important to just note that. Thank you, yes. So um, we minute that and we'll note it indeed as we go forward with the refresh of our overall Council VCS strategy uh, during the course of the next um, year. Um, 
I can't see any more hands online, um, uh, so I'll give Sally the final word. Just, just a final word, my colleague but Fabian Coates can't be with me today, but I wanted to just thank him for the work that he put in, because I know I know particularly around finding members of the community that were willing to talk when he was speaking about mental health and that intersectionality yeah. of the stigma around mental health with that community meant that pulling that focus group, group together and, and being able to do that in-depth work was, is, is fantastic. So I wanted to just say thank you, Fabian, and get that on, on record. Thank you. We will record our thanks to Fabian um, in our minutes. Thank you very much. Um, item seven is the uh, tobacco service uh, needs assessment. Um, uh, I don't know who wants to kick it off, um, Nikki, I've seen you come yes. uh, turn your camera on, so I presume it's you. Off you go. Thank yes, you. Yes, and my colleague Mariana is here with me. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you're great. Thanks. Okay, great. I'm just going to present some slides here as well, if you don't mind. Slowly. There we go. So, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nikki Basil. It is a pleasure to be here. I am the tobacco lead and the senior public health specialist um, at City and Hackney. And I am very pleased to be here with my colleague, Mariana Atron. Um, I think she's on there somewhere. She is. Um, and she's our public health analyst. Um, and we are excited to share the findings and the recommendations from the tobacco needs assessment uh, for City and Hackney that was published just this January. Let's see. Um, so we're going to provide an overview of the main findings and recommendations, um, as well as to how, um, how they relate to our local priorities and our plans and our initiatives, um, such as intro the introduction of our new stop smoking service provider. And at the end of this presentation, um, during our discussion, we'll be seeking your input on two questions. So to provide your input, um, you're welcome to, for those of you who are in person and who have your phone, you can scan the QR code or um, Mariana's just added to the chat function. You can join menti.com uh, with the code provided. Um, this will just off offer us an opportunity to gather as much feedback as possible, but we'll also provide the opportunity for verbal discussion as well. So these questions that we will share at the end, but just to prompt you to have them in the back of your mind as we carry along, um, is one, how can the Health and Wellbeing Board use your influence to effectively implement the recommendations from the needs assessment? We encourage you to consider this both as a collective body and as leaders within your respective organizations. Number two is how can we enhance the alignment between our local tobacco control plans and the priorities outlined in Hackney's health and well-being strategy? So um, what is this report exactly? This report is really important um, because as we know, and as I hope you know, smoking is the biggest preventable cause of death disability and in ill health. Now, smoking kills up to two thirds of its long-term users. Um, ASH, which is the Action for Smoking and Health, estimates that the total societal cost of smoking in Hackney to be around 215 million pounds per year. And we know that smoking is the leading cause of health inequity inequalities in the United Kingdom and it counts for half of the difference in life expectancy between the richest and poorest in society. Children growing up in environments where smoking is normalized are much more likely to smoke themselves, further reproducing the inequalities across generations. Sure. So why is, this, why is this important right now? Um, it's a very pressing matter and I'm actually really happy to share that yesterday something major happened, as Councillor Kennedy is very well aware. Uh, a tobacco and vape bill was announced in Parliament, and this bill stands to be one of the most significant public health interventions in a generation. Um, and this was a result of consulta consultation on smoking and vaping, which we participated in, which has led to a government commitment to getting to a smoke-free generation. Um, this bill, if it's approved, would increase the age to buy tobacco products. So ensuring that individuals aged 15 and under today will never legally be able to purchase cigarettes. Now, this feels 
very personal to me. I have children the ages of 10 and 12 at home. And so the idea that they will never legally be able to buy a cigarette is really overwhelmingly exciting. Um, uh, as well, if this bill passes, it would regulate vape um, products and the displays. As you know, they're very pervasive the way that they're being marketed, um, both in shops and online. Um, and it would also enforce penalties for violations, um, again, to crack at this just pervasive market of um, targeting vapes to children. Um, the prime minister has also committed to a single use of vape ban in order to tackle raising rates of vaping amongst young people and to prevent further environmental damage. And a draft legislation is currently being put through DEFRA via the Environment Act. Um, and we're providing input right now on that consultation as there are a number of loopholes which we're concerned about. So these significant efforts really demonstrate that smoking is very much a political health and society priority. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Mariana, who will share um, the tobacco needs assessment findings. Thank you, Nick. So I worked in on this tobacco needs assessment with other public health colleagues, and we will briefly uh, share some of the findings. Next, please. Smoking prevalence more than half in Hackney since 2011, but this progress seems to be installed in the last few years. Currently, we have around 29,000 smokers, about 14% of Hackney population. Next, please. Some groups have higher smoking prevalence compared to the average. In this table, you can see the characteristics of residents with higher smoking prevalence across the following categories, sex, age, ethnicity, deprivation, occupation, housing tenure, and other vulnerable groups, such as people with severe mental illness, engaged with substance use, and homeless. You have this slide, so I will just give an example that those in social rented houses are around 50% more likely to smoke compared to average, but they are eight times more likely to smoke compared to those who own a house outright. Also in the box below the table, you can see some ethnic groups that are usually hidden within the other ethnic categories, for example, Turkish, Kurdish, and Cypriots that also have a high uh, smoking prevalence. Next, please. In different parts of Hackney, there are big differences in how many people smoke. In map A on the left, you can see that Well Street's common primary care network has the highest recorded proportion of smokers. When we look at map B, which shows smaller areas, we can see a notable variation within the city and Hackney primary care networks. Next, please. Based on local and national insights across people with different demographics and ethnicities, key factors in starting and quitting smoking involve cultural influence, peer pressure, difficulty to break in a habit, and stress relief. While the motivations to quit include health benefits, cost support available, including network, and setting an example for children. This is important for directing communication towards the drivers rather than reiterating the well-known risks of smoking. Next, please. Smoking can be particularly harmful during pregnancy for both the mother and the baby. And in Hackney, the smoking prevalence and rate of low birth weight which can be caused by smoke have both been relatively stable in the last four, seven, uh, ten years. It's also important to consider our orthodox, orthodox Jewish community where smoking rates are usually low. This may skew our data and our smoking rate may actually be higher if these women are removed from the data. Next, please. Vaping is a relatively recent issue and no local prevalence data are available. Local insights show that uh, young people uh, are using disposable vapes. This is consistent with national data that suggests that one in five children aged between 11 and 17 have tried vaping, a significant jump from the years prior. 
Vapes are an effective stop smoking tool for adults, but it's necessary to discourage their uptake among young people and no smokers. Insights suggest misperceptions of the relative harms of vapes compared with cigarettes. This could complicate important tobacco control work to date, underscoring the careful balance of holding multiple messages at once. If you smoke, vaping is safer. If you don't smoke, don't vape. Next, please, and over to you, Nikki. Thank you, Mariana. Um, so I will quickly review our local response um, as was outlined in the report, um, which is exciting because this is my day-to-day -day job. Um, our local Tobacco Control Alliance, chaired by Councillor Kennedy, thank you for this. Um, uh, our TCA brings together these key partners who provide strategic leadership at a systems level uh, on a borough-wide borough -wide for our tobacco control work. And our partnership priorities directly link in with many of the recommendations that um, I will outline that were in our um, JSNA. And so to highlight specifically three priorities, the ones that are in green, um, that we are working on this year as part of our TCA include one, um, a coordinated communications across our partnerships, ensuring that our messaging is consistent and also targeted for the different populations that we serve, really focusing on health inequities as well. Um, the second is to denormalize smoking among young people. Um, later this year, we are hoping to conduct um, local insights of young people on both smoking and vaping with some of our supplemental um, resources. Um, and a third priority this year is to maximize the benefits and to balance the risks associated with e-cigarettes or vapes. Now we know that vaping is much less harmful than smoking cigarettes, and we want to be able to get that message out into the community, but we also need to do that while discouraging non-smokers and young people from ever picking up vapes. Um, supporting this work, we are currently participating um, in a program called the Swap to Stop Scheme, which we had not yet mentioned in this JSNA because we've just begun to, begun to roll this out. And this program is providing vapes alongside our behavioral support um, as quit aid for smokers, just as we do um, for NRT, for instance, for other um, um, medical support. Um, we, commi we commission a lot, local stop smoking service provider um, that's Whittington Health and they run our smoke free city and Hackney program and they and their subcontractors um, provide up to 12 weeks of behavioral support with a with dedicated stop smoking advisors and easy to access smoking medication like I mentioned NRTs and vapes for instance and these services are provided in many different ways um, via our GPs in community pharmacies and hospitals and other local community sites um, that might be in person or online. Now, this report highlights the importance of offering these this type of service in many different um, types of venues and locations and formats. Really emphasizes also the importance of self referrals um, and utilizing peer support to prevent relapse and the importance of implementing harm reduction strategies too. We know that we wanna push people to, to quit smoking, but we also have to identify that they might need support wherever they are along that journey. Um, and expanding efforts to reach youth through various plat room, platforms like social media is increasingly important. So those are all things that are very pressing that we're focusing on. Um, our report highlights that our smoke-free city in Hackney consistently achieves impressive performance compared to London and England and performs better than nice standards. So we should feel very proud of that. Um, our service has a high rate of smokers setting quit dates um, and more than double that of London and England. And the rate of successful smokers, which is the number of people who successfully quit at four weeks, over the total number of smokers who set a quit date. This is similar to London and England and are broadly sim similar across socioeconomic, uh, socio-demographic groups that we support. Um, the only group that performs below the average um, was young people, but the rates of success were still over nice guidance. And so this is 
majorly, this is something that we're majorly focusing on. Um, and our new Stop Smoking service provider has a lot of expertise um, in working to target young people, to bring them into their services. Um, while our provider has impressive performance, um, some groups are underrepresented in our local service, such as Turkish speaking communities, young adults, as I mentioned, as well as uh, other communities listed here. Um, Underrepresentation of adults with severe mental illness, um, individuals who are homeless, is very worrying given the very high prevalence of smoking in these groups. Um, it is important to note that those with SMI may also be picked up from our partners at least um, East London Foundation Trust as they offer a tobacco dependency treatment service pathway. And they're also participating in our current swap to stop scheme um, offering vapes, which is um, very preferred um, option for quitting to smoke at present on a local level. Um, next, I'll share that um, we are happy to announce after a very long, rigorous process that we've completed our recommissioning process and we've awarded our new stop smoking service provider. Um, the award went to an organization called Thrive Tribe. And we are working closely with them to mobilize their service while also um, decommissioning our current provider, Whittington Health. Um, the, the spec that we put together for this new stop smoking service has a very big focus on community engagement and outreach. Um, we have a new dedicated staff person that we're hiring um, for that specifically that we will be interviewing soon, as well a similar post that uh, exists within the Stop Smoking program. So one that sits within Hackney Council and then one within the program, as well as more integrated community outreach efforts kind of um, across the board. I do wanna add though that this is in addition to our already very prioritized, robust NHS referral pathways, um, which are a very important part of our Stop Smoking service. Um, Thrive Tribe, excitingly, is a local community organization and they're based in Hackney Wick, if you don't know them already. Um, and they have a really successful track record of implementing stop smoking um, service, both in and across London, as well as nationally, so in other, uh, in other locations as well. Um, they were so successful in their programming in Fulham and Hammersmith that they, um, they decreased smoking rates uh, so significantly that Fulham and Hammersmith no longer currently operate a stop smoke, a normal kind of stop smoking service program. Um, Thrive Tribe is also currently mobilizing the National Di Diabetes Prevention Program in Northeast London. So there's a lot of linkages that we're very excited about in terms of Thrive Tribe and, and in terms of their expertise and in working with youth in particular. Um, in addition to our Smoke Free City and Hackney program, we offer um, many other services and support as part of our Stop Smoking portfolio. Um, as part of the NHS tobacco dependency treatment, uh, we offer smoking cessation as part of the patient's healthcare journey to uh, for acute and maternity patients in Homerton Hospital, as well as mental health patients at East London Foundation Trust. Um, Hackney Council previously signed uh, the local authority tobacco declaration um, and Homerton Elft and the GP Confed um, all signed the NHS smoke free pledge. Our health and well-being team also provides uh, lessons in primary and secondary school um, on the harms of smoking um, and the use of e-cigarettes. I just met with them earlier to talk about kind of new trends um, in youth vaping as well. And we employ a senior trading standards officer. I'm sure you've heard of Dave Hunt. Um, he's a national lead on vaping as well. Um, and he works with our trading standards team to combat um, the supply of illicit and underage um, sale of tobacco, alcohol, and vapes. Um, so I'll now just very quickly um, go through some of our recommendations because I'd also really love to hear um, uh, your thoughts on how this integrates with your work. Um, so the key recommendations that came out of the report include um, a sustained coordination is really necessary to address um, smoking inequalities. Um, number two is we need to ensure that there is a focus on youth prevention and quitting. Um, number three is the importance of denormalizing smoking um, and advocating for smoke-free spaces. Number four is to support um, tailored um, high to support uh, to provide tailored support for high prevalence communities. 
five is to fund evidence-based stop smoking services. We are definitely still doing that, as I just mentioned. Um, number six is to improve our GP record reporting. So currently, there's a variation in our smoking status uh, recording across our different GPs. And so we're wanting to improve that data quality as much as possible. Um, number seven is a sustained investment in enforcement to prevent underage and illicit sales. Um, there is new funding that's coming out for enforcement on the national level, which we're excited about. Um, and number eight and number nine is to launch a coordinated campaign, which would clarify the benefits of vaping um, for smoking cessation while discouraging uptake among young people and non-smokers, while also promoting quit attempts and highlighting the very um, myriad of available um, support that we offer for smoking um, in our community. So. That's what we're currently working on. Um, that's what was outlined in our JSNA, but those are also the initiatives that we're working on um, day to day um, as part of our wider tobacco control portfolio. So if there are no pressing questions, and Councillor Kennedy, by all means, tell me if there are, um, I wonder if we could move into um, some feedback from the group. What do you think? Yes, absolutely. Thank you um, very much, Nikki. Um, a couple of things I just Please. wanted to add. One is that um, when we re-procured, we were very um, sort of like agile on our feet, weren't we? Because some new, we suspected new funding might be available from government. Yeah. And, and we've managed to do the re-procurement and catch the new funding from government. Yeah there was a period where we could have put everything on pause during our procurement process knowing that supplemental funding was likely to be coming but we were steadfast because we didn't want to have to stop and start the whole process over again and it was the right decision because now we're at a place where we are ready to continue our services and also adopt this supplemental funding so we're in a very strong place because of the decisions that we made yeah yeah um well done, I wanted to highlight that. And also, the second thing I wanted to make everyone aware in case you missed it was that the legislation was finally brought forward uh, yesterday in Parliament. Um, so that reducing the um, minimum age of sale legislation will be put, put before um, Parliament um, at the moment. There's cross-party support for it, and it really does look like we're at the moment of the dial completely changing on uh, smoking prevalence. We used to say that that 2030 goal of being smoke free, i.e. only 5% of our population, as opposed to 14% at the moment being smokers, was a bit of a pipe dream, if you'll excuse the pun. But um, with change in the um, age of sale, um, it really does look like that is um, achievable. Um, and the work that we're doing here, and uh, I think especially the way we've um, re-procured and have got these targets, um, especially for working with our really hard to reach, um, sort of like stubborn smokers, as it were, out there in those um, specific communities. I think we can see um, a real um, sea change on something that has been um, a real health disbenefit to our population um, for decades. So it's, it's a really exciting place to be. Um, uh, one of the recommendations, I, Andreas, I saw you writing about the GP. Do you want to um, quickly comment on that recommendation number six, improving the reporting of smoking status in GP records? Yes, of course we can work um, with our GP practices to make sure that that is um, a focus uh, for the practices. Um, I'm sure the GPs are as well uh, aware as the rest of us that this, um, smoking is one of the most preventable um, areas uh, for health. So we will be working with them. We were, the GP Confederation was part of the partnership that was previously delivering the stop smoking um, service. Uh, we're not going forward as part of that um, service. So one of the things I would highlight is ensuring that there's a good link to primary mm -hmm. care and GP practices in uh, for the new uh, provider uh, as they deliver it, because that will help in ensuring that we get commitment from the um, GPs and the practices to do that. Yeah, we will, we will note that at future Tobacco Control Alliance meetings, won't we, Nikki? Yeah. Absolutely, and that's very much forefront in our mind um, as we're working um, 
with our provider to mobilize this, they will be working, they've committed already to working very closely with our GPs and they, they've they not only committed to it, they know it's integral to the success of our stop smoking service. So absolutely. Um, with regards to your um, uh, questions, I'm starting to see some hands go up. So I'll go straight okay. to uh, uh, Dublina, please. Thank you very much. Um, a brilliant uh, set of papers and presentation. Um, I probably have just three kind of um, thoughts and maybe questions that together, um, if not being done currently together, we could. Uh, the first one is with the new provider and the mobilization piece that you're talking. I'd be quite keen to understand whether you anticipate any change in the treatment function, particularly where it interfaces um, with the, tr the treatment function. And then uh, a little bit about data, I was just reflecting. Um, in terms of the cost, the morbidity cost of smoking, um, are, we, are we in the position, and if we are, I'd really be keen to see that data, um, are we in the position about actual outcome triangulation? Um, Linked to the um, uh, linked to COPD, and I know you've got some mortality data, but actually with uh, cardiovascular um, endpoints as well as stroke, um, in terms of outcome measures, I know there's the, the the things that are in the KPI, so to speak, are predominantly about number of people that have self-reported stopping smoking. Do we have any longer term kind of abstinence data as well? And the reason I, I'm, I'm saying this is this is this is absolutely the Homerton's um, um, strategy, part of strategy about improving the health. And this is linked to the priority one of Homerton's strategy. So um, if we can do this kind of the triangulation piece together, I'd be very, very interested to to here and work together with you. Yes, certainly. So your first question was around on kind of the treatment piece of it. So in terms of the uh, the NHS long-term care plan, um, there is a major focus on ensuring that there are strong linkages um, and continued support um, with our stop smoking service provider and our wider tobacco control efforts. And so I work very closely with Homerton um, and the East London Foundation Trust um, in terms of acute and um, um, prenatal and um, in the mental health uh, focus as well. And so there's a continued focus on that. In fact, we are looking right now at potential opportunities to expand some services um, with our stop smoking um, supplemental funding. The funding cannot be used for to replace anything, but it can be used to enhance. So that is something that I'm currently coordinating right now. Um, I you had a question specifically about the data. I know that Jane is on the line and she might be able to respond a little bit more effectively about um, our access to various data for the different health conditions. Jane, can I ask you to jump in there? Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to clarify a question. Is the question about whether people sustain a quit if they successfully quit for long term? It's That is really tricky. So we know that most people quit I don't I can't even remember it's something like 13 times before they actually are successful um, and one of the things that we can that we really try to do is to monitor for at least 12 weeks and um, because that's what the nice nice guidance says it's actually quite hard to do that but what we're trying to do through the service the new service in particular is to um, continue support in some way post the end of the intervention, particularly for people who need it, whether that's through peer support or whatever that might be. And so we're hoping to monitor, but it's quite, as you can imagine, it's quite hard because you just get quite high rates of like loss to follow up because people don't respond. But it would, it's something that we really try to do. And if there's a way in which we could work together to try and see if we can monitor that more effectively i can't think off the top of my head how we we do that but um yeah it's definitely something because that's that, that's the win that's the win it's not just quitting after four weeks and then going back to it in a few months but we do know that most people are they're not going to give up first second third fourth time unfortunately even with a evidence-based stop smoking service but yeah it'd be really interesting to continue that conversation thank you jane yeah i think it took me about 10 goes before I finally quit. 
Um, and, and I think I'm fairly sure that the average attempt is in double figures. Yeah. Yeah. And Councillor Kennedy has been a really big proponent for pushing this um, for for stop smoking overall and getting this legislation to where it is. So thank you also for your efforts in that regard, Councillor Kennedy. Your sharing of that personal story was shared across No Smoking Day um, that was on March 13th and beyond. And so that those personal messages are really resonating. And there is a huge focus um, to get this through right now. And so our fingers and toes are crossed. It would be substantial. Um, I, I want to I want to be um, conscious of time. Would it make yes, sense to flash please. up the mentee at this point, or do or have we run out of time at this point? Because um, Mariana could it. throw it up in case anybody responded there. Um, I think go for it, and I'll ask people to uh, okay. as we move on to other items um, to think about that and to take it away with them um, on their phones or their devices. That would be really great. So just to, to like say, to there's these slides, yeah. wouldn't you? I would, I, I would absolutely love that. So there's two questions. Um, they were provided in your slides. Um, and the first question is here, how can the Health and Wellbeing Board use your influence to implement these recommendations? You could also, um, I don't know that we'll have access to the chat, um, but feel free to add them onto here. There's two questions that will be up there. So yeah, thank and you the, all. And the QR code opens opens those mentee questions for you. And then yes. just sit as a separate window um, open. That's right, but this um, there's only a short period by which they can be left open, so it's yeah, not something you can. What's your time frame for it, Mariana? Can you remind me of it? We overrun the time, but it's just a. No, how long can the mentee stay up? Not yeah. in the purpose of this meeting, but continuously. I'm not sure, but the first question is going to disappear when we move to the right. second question. So exactly. if you have an additional comments, you can just email Nikki. I, I will share her email uh, in the chat in case okay. someone wants to add something later. Right. Thank you. Um, we'll put your contact details in the minutes as well. Great. It's on the last slide as well. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, thank, Councillor Kenny. Thank you all. Very rich report. Thank you. Um, uh, item eight, um, uh, Chris, this is to you, the uh, hidden and essential workforce, um, please. Um, so looking very particularly at some of our shift staff, um, uh, some of our lowest paid staff, grew out of work in the city, um, but is applicable to um, all our organizations because all of us at some point um, employ and use agent staff and have staff working. Um, sociable hours so <clears throat> thank you very much and thank you to frooks who, who put together the paper and has been working very hard on it so this did originate in the city of london um it came very much um from uh the experience in covid where you literally did see the only people coming into work with the hidden and essential workforce um in the paper that uh, is um got brevity on its side we probably did actually omit the kind of the lived experience. And I just want to draw your attention on the screen. This is the report that came from the work that started off in the City of London. Um, the City of London Health and Wellbeing Board did adopt this very early. Um, and we have been bringing this to a number of fora, but we realized that we haven't actually brought it to the Hackney Health and Wellbeing Board. So this, this report, which is very much based upon um, interviews and the lived experience of people in the that city of London, but I'm fairly confident that it does have a lot of applicability of lived experience of some of our staff who are undertaking cleaning roles, who may be um, subcontracted, uh, contracted out, or may be um, employed directly by organisations that are members of our health and wellbeing board. And what you have in um, this report is the lived experience of people who are working, are, are really struggling to, to juggle their work life, um, which is often a, a very unsocial hour, um, and working in uh, places where the daytime workers would often never see, would never experience, never come into contact. And because sometimes they are contracted out, but even if they are actually part of the, the core work for them, they may not have the same access to occupational health facilities, access primary care, rest facilities, uh, food preparation. And so what we have, um, without any shadow of doubt, is a workforce that's hidden, essential, and with really significant health inequalities. 
What the report, I think, lays out quite clearly is that this isn't inevitable. There are things that we can do um, to listen to the hidden and essential workforce. Um, on some occasions, small changes to when people's working hours start would mean that they could use uh, the underground rather than the bus system, which would reduce people's uh, mute time um, from four or five hours to, to half an hour if if we are looking at um, slightly more flexible times for starting. But it is really very much around things such as um, access to sick pay and that there's differential accesses to sick pay. If you only have access to statutory sick pay, you not only have a much lower, far lower than the London living wage income if you're unwell, but there's also inequalities about when you can actually start to access the, the sick pay if you're unwell. And what we found um, from the experience in the city and, and uh, spending time talking to the hidden essential workforce is that very often people are coming into work whilst they're ill. During COVID, clearly that was something that was of huge interest to everybody in public health in particular. But now we're back into more normal times and perhaps the essential workforce is becoming even more hidden again that we wanted to, to bring this to the Health and Wellbeing Board's attention. So what you have in the um, report is a number of recommendations where um, we feel that uh, all of us in the Council and our partnership organisations, as well as businesses more broadly, can make relatively small changes. There has been some economic um, evaluation undertaken and we would be confident that they would almost certainly be um, uh, they would pay for themselves and actually make savings as, as well. Um, and so we are asking for the Health and Wellbeing Board to um, endorse the reports and the recommendations and take as a key priority the hidden and essential workforce so that we can make a significant difference to um, many of our workers' lives in ACME, um, improve health uh, and wellbeing and reduce health inequalities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, and for the avoidance doubt, everybody, those are the four recommendations on the bottom of page uh, 158 um, at, at paragraph three. Uh, so we're be being asked to support uh, those principles as outlined um, by Chris um, and to confirm that as member organisations, we will review our own employment um, and uh, recruitment processes uh, to try and make sure that we um, bear in mind all the concerns there. Um, uh, it all looks to me um, like something that we all absolutely should be doing. Um, uh, and therefore I'm expecting us, he said, a, a bit with a bit of trepidation, to all be able to uh, uh, agree to it. Um, does anybody want to make any comments, or ask any questions for clarification? Um, or even suggest any reason why we might not wish to sign up to this as a board. And I think we are hidden in the detail. Yes. Is some significant changes in our approach to the hidden and essential workforce in terms of ensuring access to safe sick pay, ensuring equal access to work facilities, looking at whether we are going to be able to provide people with to attend uh, primary care appointments, etc. So, don't underestimate that although this is, I would hope, compelling, we are actually asking for quite significant changes to be made. Um, and so, again, although it is brief in its summary, I think it is quite profound in the um, actions that we do, we are recommending that partners take away um, and implement. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Williams, Cabinet Member for Employment. Really positive. Um, so, and um, and of course, as you'll remember, that there was a lot of concern, particularly during, uh, as you said, during during the pandemic, um, also panic actually, um, about sick pay. So, I'm, I'm sure councillors would. Uh, backbench councils would support um, the recommendations and, and the report. Um, I did want to just add a comment about safety, particularly for those who uh, work on social hours, late hours, early hours, um, and for women in particular as they're traveling to and from work. 
um, it's something that comes up in discussions uh, with employers um, in the borough and further afield. And there are some good examples, though, um, and I wonder if we can somehow incorporate where best practice, uh, where employers do have follow best practice in terms of supporting um, their staff to travel safely. Sorry. Was that okay, the, yeah, uh, no, I've been distracted by the vitamin C. Um, <laughs> Which, which most of us seem to need at the moment. <laughs> um, uh, thank you. Um, uh, yes, uh, a very good point to be made. Um, and um, and it's, um, you're right, Chris, they are they're quite difficult, might involve significant changes, but you're asking us, you've worded it very well, you're asking us to confirm support of the principles yeah. Um, and you're asking us to review current working arrangements. You're not asking us to commit lock, stock and barrel to a sudden change next year, um, but to be aware of these challenges and these issues and to work <coughs> aggressively on them on. And I think, I mean, th th this, this is the right thing to do. Absolutely. And clearly it will have implications for how people are employed and the type of contracts. And I think being a realist and what we did also look to learn lessons from is that how the London living wage was implemented. So you need to make the case. You need to be aware of the fact that this will involve for some people making the economic case. And we, we, we started collecting information to do that. <clears throat> But it's also recognizing that you probably there are some things you can literally do you know overnight um about making you know when cleaners come in making it really clear you can you know bring your food with you you can use a microwave you can use a telephone if you want to so some very relatively straightforward things but a lot of this is going to be a slightly longer process of actually ensuring that the focus is, remains on the hidden and essential workforce and that the changes do get implemented in a phased way and i think for the london living wage it was you know if we change our procurement practices we can make sure that all of our contracts make reference to, to the importance um of, of, of those uh, issues raised but for where we've got contracts now I think if we if we have the conversations with the contracted providers about why we want to do this, um, that's the approach we're taking in the city where we've got you know contracted out workers is we're asking to to be able to have the conversations with the providers to make the case. Um, at some point, we may be asking them to make voluntarily changes. They may identify that's a cost pressure, and we again would hopefully be saying, well, actually, this this is cost saving if you look at this uh, round. But as with the London Living Wage, there were occasions where funds were set up to enable existing contracts that we have for outsourced facility staff to then be able to implement what we want. Um, and that's something, again, you know, organisations need to be careful, be aware of well, who provides your hidden and essential workforce. If it's contracted out, what does your contract say? Can you do this voluntarily? If it's going to require a cost, we'd ask you to start thinking about that cost. In the health and well-being board i think it's outside of our scope to to go into that sort of specific level of detail yeah. but if people are with us on the principles what then comes is a, is a more detailed piece of work to actually review your contracts look at your workforce listen to what their needs are and then um implement some of the recommendations that we've outlined thank you that's very clear i see no further hands up online <clears throat> so um, I'm taking it that is assent, um, and uh, we decide to confirm those uh, recommendations. Thank you very much for bringing them. Would you like a progress update at some point? I think that would be really yes, helpful. please. Um, and I have half of us operating where progress has been made uh, would also be welcome, just as we do with the London and Wage. Uh, thank you. Um, that concludes item eight. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, item nine um, is an update on our um, ageing well strategy and our dementia friendly work. Um, I think I've got Judy, yes, online, um, and she's popped her camera on and is waving. Hello, Judy. Over to you. 
going to be me presenting. Oh, sorry. So, Jida's going to chip in where necessary to help Sonia. Sonia. Yeah, thank you. So I came here this time last year and back to give an update on the ageing well strategy and dementia friendly work. And at the time when I reported, I explained that I hadn't been able to actually mobilise the work um, proactively because of other pressures, including the um, cost of living and poverty reduction response. But I'm pleased to say that Judy has been um, in, in, in post for the last year um, and is now continuing in the service. And we've, we've mainstreamed the, the support that's needed around this. And I've also had SIMRAP working on it. Um, and so this is an update that I will focus on particular areas of, but the full report covers um, the, 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 the strategic context for this work. Some of the issues that, that are impacting the, the work, which I'm not going to focus on. Three areas where through the um, development of the implementation of the strategy, we've identified need a proactive focus in order to ensure that we meet the we meet the goals of the strategy around them, which I will talk about. Um, and then there is um, an update on the engagement, um, which we have continued to um, do through the active Hackney Older Citizens Committee. So there's an update on how we continue to work with residents um, on this. Um, and also there's an update on how all of the key commitments, how all of them are being driven and taken forward. But as I say, I'm going to focus more today on the um, proactive work that we've been doing and on some of the questions for you, um, which which are really, um, I, think, I think the critical one is that um, I'm going to talk about how this population is going to change over the next 20 years. So the critical one is how the Health and Wellbeing Board can help the whole system to think about the future increase in the older population. And while we're yeah. often focused on a very, I'm going to be talking about this in the next item as well, you know, we're often going to be focused in quite a short term time frame, especially at the moment with funding um, cuts that have to come in as well. But actually, um, if we don't start to think about this now as a system, then we're storing up problems in the future, potentially, if our population does change as projected. Um, the second is how we can actually support developing that intersectional evidence-based approach to thinking about the increase in the po older population, because as part of the Ageing Well strategy, it's not just delivering the strategy or driving that, it's about creating the intelligence that um, becomes a resource in the long term. Um, and the third is, is about understanding currently um, where the opportunity is for us to better connect with the work that is happening in the health and wellbeing system, um, whether that's the ICM or the institutions, um, to plan for that population change, because um, we would really like to connect better the work that's led by the Council on Ageing Well with the work that's led by the NHS and, 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 and others. And, and I include the voluntary community sector in there because um, the um, next immediate opportunities are first of all, to, um, to, to look at how we can um, like recognize that we want to work with the voluntary and community sector to create that evidence space to attract the external investment in this area. Obviously, Hackney has done well before with connecting Hackney. Um, and to be able to also um, look at the particular issue um, that I will highlight in a bit more detail, but that has become more of a growing concern since the pandemic of older people not leaving their homes as much and being more isolated. And then the knock-on impact on health needs when they do, there is an urgent need that either ends up in hospital or ends up or maybe goes through hospital and then ends up in our, um, you know, needing a, a care package. And, and one of the challenges at the moment is obviously the voluntary community sector, who, who are the main people who are going to pick up those needs before they hit a statutory threshold, are not necessarily always set up to do work, um, connect, you know, to connect with people who are at home. A lot of the models, by necessity, are about people working through. There have been really good examples. I remember St Joe's work around, you know, tackling social uh, of, of isolation and, 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 and reaching out, but actually systematically we probably need to think about how we can move to models of preventative support 
that actually are about reaching people who are who, who are not um, as able to get out of the home. Um, and then the final one is recognising what I've just said and the relationship between the social connections priority, which you'll be hearing an update about shortly. So um, the strategic context, as I say, I mean, obviously these projections can change. Um, and Hackney has been through a lot of change in recent years, which may affect these projections in terms of what we're seeing in families um, leaving leaving the borough at the moment. You know, the impact of COVID, the impact of um, people working and um, being able to work from home and breakfast has all led to quite a lot of what I would say at the moment is population change, but also quite an uncertain future um, projection for us. But based on current um, GLA projections, we are looking at the over 55 age group increasing by nearly 80%, so 42,000 to 75,000. Looking at the over 65 group increasing from 22,000 to 42,000, so nearly double. And I know that's reflected in our data, but I think it's important sometimes to just really bring it to life. And I've worked in Hackney for 15 years, so for me, actually, that sort of time scale doesn't feel like that much time. Yeah. When you think about what we need, you know, what we could benefit from doing now, it's the sort of time scale that we need to also be working at. Um, so the other point to make is obviously you will know better than I that as we get an older population, um, we will see increases in dementia. And we also need to recognise that alongside that, if we carry on having a population where there are fewer families or there is more churn. We have more people moving in for a short amount of time. Um, as, as renters moving, you know, in a house together or an HMO, then there is less of that um, uh, protection in the community of the neighbourliness and so on. And also at the moment we have an overrepresentation of older people in social housing, but if there's more people growing old in private rented housing, then you've got that question about whether the neighbourliness will be there as a first prote protective factor in, in that. So those, I'm just setting the scene for my question, which is about what's going on at the moment in the system and, and whether we need to create some space for long-term thinking around, around this issue. If I go to the practical things, which we are focused on at the moment, actually they all speak to the same concerns because our priorities at the moment for proactive work are about how we can become more dementia friendly, how we can look at employment being more age friendly and if I make the link back to what I was saying before if we have a population of over 55s who are which is increasing then we need to see um a, we, we need to make sure that our population of over 55 is staying in work um and being supportive to stay in work because that will be a good way to make sure that they're not actually getting older with the multiple health conditions that we currently see. It's not the only thing, but you know, it can be again, think about wider determinants, quite a big part, a big part of that. So um so how we and and um, again statistically you will hear in the national news that it's the over it's it's the over fifties group who have stopped working since the pandemic and are in that um uh, not working, not seeking work group. And again, that may not, you know, with cost with cost of living increasing, that may not be sustainable in the long term. So we're doing work around how we can make the current system that supports people more age friendly. And then the third area is the area that I've talked about, um, about residents um, who aren't getting out at all and what we could do, what we could do differently. So um, there is there is a more detailed update in each of those um, about what we're doing currently um but i think just to kind of try and move to the discussion more quickly um it's really that's that's the context but actually there's more that we could all do together so um if it's okay chair i think I, it would be better if we could move on to the the conversation and i could pick up any questions about the work that we are progressing as well. so going back to those questions that are at the top yeah um yeah it's the how we're preparing for that impact for future point opportunity as well i shouldn't make it all negative you know the other part of this um uh, aging world strategy that was originally a, a commitment from the last administration was not just speaking to that population of change but also the aspirations of older people to be more recognized and valued in the community and and the roles that played in volunteering could become even you know even bigger and more significant in the in the future so how are we prepared for that that opportunity as well as the impact and then um 
yeah, how can we work with you on some of that um, and, 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 and do that long term thinking? And then the, the three areas, how do we connect better on those? Those three areas around um, dementia, employment support, and um, particularly there's a question here that's about um, social people not leaving their homes. And social isolation. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's that's a really useful um, uh, outline, and I think that we should all bear in mind that strategic context. That that's extraordinary when you think about the numbers of fifty-five-year-olds um, in the next twenty years um, nearly doubling, and over sixty-five-year-olds um, uh, as well. That's uh, it's going to be a huge pressure on us as a whole. Uh, system, um, isn't it, that, that, that we're going to have to uh, think about. Um, how does it feel in your um, individual organisations? Um, are, are, people, are people confident um, that, that you're up for an increase in the number of older people and how your services um, are going to have to reflect that um, and deal with that um, in whichever sector you're in? I'm looking for comments from everyone. It, it feels like you're all daunted by the fact that the number of older people you're going to have to have responsibility for and interact with um, is good. Where, where are we having these uh, the wider conversations at the moment? Um, uh, does it feel, because you've asked a very specific question about um, do we need more space for that longer term thinking to answer the, the strategic question? Does it, does it feel to you, Sonia, like we do? We will need to do some long term visioning yeah. in a way for the, for the borough and, and part of looking at, a, you know, it's sort of separate from this, part of looking at how we reconvene partners. Um, and, but obviously we want to wait for a new, you know, the permanent chief executive in place. But yeah, for sure, the council we we'll need to work with partners to convene some thinking about term, you know, future thinking, having adopted a community strategy six years ago. So it's timely and the population has also changed as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Jess, thank you. Hi, um, thank you for the update. Um, I support the idea that we need more space to talk about um, our ageing of population, how we support them, particularly to get out of the house. Judy, Harris um, and I, with many other voluntary and community sector organisations, have been looking at this. Um, we brought together, um, I, I don't want to say the wrong number, but probably over 20 organisations over yes. the past few months. Sorry, can I ask you, just to, we've got some background. Um, I don't... Not sure it's anybody in this room that's behind me. It might have been in my office, but I think I I'm now the only person talking, hopefully. Yeah. So ho let's hope no one's on the phone for the next minute. Um is that is that okay? Am I that's better? So I'll just I'll just continue. Um, yeah, so we've been doing some really brilliant work understanding from community organisations what opportunities they see and what gaps they see. And and really there are very good ideas. Um, the main barrier that we experience is funding. Um, I think that lots of the organisations had ideas that were uh, very practical. We talked about walking buses as an example, and these organisations that we're working with, they do, lots of them do go into people's homes, um, but obviously that requires a lot more capacity uh, because to visit one person in their home, you know, you've got to make make at least an hour and a half really of time, uh, which people may not have. Um, I think that it's really important for us to be working with the voluntary and community sector to find the solutions because ultimately um, they are going to be able to um, have the most cost efficient uh, solutions when they're working within the neighbourhood because the locality will, uh, like a kind of circular economy type um, approach will be the most local um, and efficient solution rather than relying on wider statutory services. So I think that the space that is created can piggyback on what Judy and I um, and the rest of the voluntary and community sector have been doing um, and build on that and it, it can be bottom up which would be excellent. Uh, thank you, very useful points and um, 
the neighbourhood forums and the neighbourhood ways of working are going to be vital to those as well, aren't they? Yeah, so Hack Me Downs, I think, has focused a lot on this um, and the health inequalities funding that's come um, via, I don't know, the central NHS um, is going to be spent on um, getting housebound people out of um, home. Yeah, thank you. Um, looking for any other comments um, on this? not not seeing any in the room so um, i think it's um uh yeah just on the sorry thank you for the update just on the barriers that you found with older people was there a common theme or was it lots of different things that you found older people were finding just in terms of going out more was it always it mainly just the impact of the pandemic and the and the fallout of that yeah she's actually doing some more detailed work okay so. great um, Judy, are you okay to speak directly to that question? Thank you. And then what would be helpful, actually, if there's time, is just to hear if that resonates with, you know, that hypothesis, which we know has some, we know it's not just a hypothesis, that this is affecting people's health outcomes, and it is affect, you know, it's it is because we're working, as we say in here, we're working with neighbourhoods and with anticipatory care. So if it is affecting when people actually get help, I could be helpful to see it from other perspectives that is the case or, or not. Mm -hmm. But you do. Yeah, really happy to answer that question. Thank you. So we did a bit of kind of qualitative uh, and, and quantitative research, but we spoke to a yeah, proactive care team, to GPs, social prescribers, VCS groups, the lead dementia nurse. And we just picked up that they're really, I mean, they're issues that have been, that no one will be surprised for me to tell you about in terms of transport and a lack of support workers, things like that. But also, but then compounded by the impact of the pandemic and the cost of living crisis, because Hackney's older population are the second poorest group of older people in England. So that's had a massive um, impact on them. And that affects, mm. their, in so many ways, affects someone's capacity and willingness to kind of to, to go out, um, like financially, but also, I think, um, psychologically. Um, yeah, so it was, soft, it was to do with like the closure of um, Hackney um, community transport, just general issues with transport, a fear of, of getting sick from the pandemic, a loss of social habits, declining health through the pandemic because people weren't getting the health care they, they usually um, received, and the cost of living and also kind of areas changing through the pandemic and things being more online and kind of not feeling as as at home and comfortable um and then in terms of uh people with dementia yes just people being uh like no there's no support for people to 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 come out a real lack of support workers and and the while there's always great schemes that um like the proactive care um program and social prescribing there's not really schemes that take people out that visit people at home and take them out and there's because it's for cost money but there are things that people felt could be done in the short term to encourage people who were kind of on the margins of of just needing a bit of support to to, to re-engage with the world and and then they that's not happening and they they get more and more used to not going outside um so there's some great work going on in the practice care team around around frailty but when we were talking about where people are referred to who need help to go out really there's just one service which is the volunteer center hackney befriending service and that now has a three-month waiting list and the other befriending service has now shut down so there's a real there's really no one really going to people's homes and taking them mm -hmm. taking I, I knew they had a waiting list i didn't realize it was that long judy golly uh chris so thank you very much for, for the report. And, and if I just want to check my own saying, so I think Hackney Council has an aging well strategy, but in terms of quite a lot of what the broader partnership could do in relation to this is probably what is the ICB doing in terms of some of their service developments <coughs> and priorities. And I'm not sure to what extent we have got some of those broader preventative approaches being focused on within the NHS. So things around remaining active, you know, your cardiovascular health, um, well controlling your diabetes. I mean, there's a lot of medically orientated elements that will make quite a significant difference as to whether whether you get dementia or when you get dementia and the, the extent of, of um, comorbidities and disabilities. 
So I'm wondering in terms of what's the priority, uh, and Councillor Kennedy, I think you're our representative on the I am. D, but is where where is the read across from what the council is doing to the broader partnership with the NHS? Um, there's a number of interesting areas. The, the commissioning of HIV services is coming down to the ICB in April 2025. We have about, I think, 2,000 people. I'm not confident on my figures now, between 1,500 and 2,000 people living with HIV. It's an ageing cohort. HIV-related dementia, we know, is a very um, debilitating and costly and often very preventable. But it's that sort of, where do we get some of the, the broader join-up that Health and Wellbeing Board is, is often tasked to do? Um, I think this is a strategy that runs to 2025. So again, what, what's the, of our partners, do they have an approach to also developing action plans, strategies, implementations after, after is there an opportunity for us to use the ICB? Because I suspect it's not just Hackney that's now got a, a very different population demographic where previously we were young and um, uh, looking at increasing school places and now we're actually looking it's been surprisingly quick but a different demographic um, uh, future so so I just yes for, for those colleagues who represent the NHS and, and others um, what what can we do to show the prevention and the, the broader um, partnership approach to ageing well yeah thanks points very well made Pete um, the wider North East London NHS strategy recognises the need for um, uh, prevention, but struggles in the current funding climate to identify the resources that could do things like take the pressure off the v, uh, uh, VCH befriending programme, for example, or provide uh, more support across the system um, for those programmes when all our research is showing us how much we need it. Um, uh, so. The, good and positive points for us all to take away and i think finding finding that space sonia where um we feel we can have those longer term conversations um uh, uh, is i would say the priority that comes out of um that discussion um and actually leads us because I see no further hands, really. Sorry, do you mind if I come back on two things? Yeah, yeah thank you. And then do you want to sort of like uh, roll, it, roll it on to, to item uh, 10? Thank so, you. Um, so, so, first of all, thank you, Jess, for the work that you are doing with Judy, and hopefully we can collaborate together and actually draw in some, 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 some funding together for, for this. Um, I think that that what the, the granular example that Chris gave about the commissioning, you know, HIV, Asian cohorts, that sort of thing, would be really helpful to be able to um, map what the opportunities are on the I, you know, on the ICB. And yeah. perhaps we can follow up with you, Councillor Kennedy, in our next one to one, yeah. particularly on that. But also, Judy and I just think that this might be something we could come back more frequently um, and talk about in terms of the, those three priority areas. Um, because there's a lot more we could deep dive into. And there's there's evidence that one of your question your questions actually memorable about where the what the barriers are. That's summarized here, but there's a lot more detail that sits behind that we could come and do a more focused um, uh, not an update, actually a discussion, you know, paper, paper on. And then final point is the strategy runs to twenty twenty five. And at some point, the members and others will have to decide what happens beyond that. But what we're trying to do, similar to the Young Futures work, is build a legacy. So have a have a focused time when we're looking at ageing well. We're looking at issues through the lens of ageing well, so that we can really develop the capacity and the understanding across the system of this mattering, you know, being centred in, in wider, wider strategy. So we're very much focused on it being about building that legacy rather than and you'll see that reflected in the actions you know it's not lots of delivery that then needed lots of additional funding it's about the system to be better and the whole borough community to be better able to support aging well thank you um and having talked so much about the social isolation it just leads us straight into um uh, the update on the uh, yeah the sorry actually joy is coming in first 
Yes, Thank hi you, everyone. Joe. Apologies, I can't be there with you in person. Can I just confirm how long we have for this item? By my calculations, it's just under 20 minutes. Is that about right or um, even less? <laughs> yes, we've got, we've only got a, a, one tiny matter arising that I've been notified of. So yeah, you've got 25 minutes. Okay, well, I'll, we'll aim for 20 minutes. Um, so thanks very much uh, for having us here. We presented to you about a year ago on the um, how, how things were going on the implementation of the health and wellbeing strategy. So I'm going to take the first couple of sections and then hand over to Sonia, who's also joined by Jenny on the financial uh, security aspect. Um, there are a number of asks uh, so that you'll have seen in the paper. So I just wonder if we want to pause at each point we have asks just to make sure we we uh, cover those um, or if you prefer to, for us to do them at the end. Um, what what would your preference be, Chair? Let's split them up, do quick brief asks after each section. OK, great. Thank you. Um, so as you'll be very aware, the, the Hackney um, Health and Wellbeing Strategy runs from 22 to 26 and there are three resident-led priorities around improving mental health increasing social connection and supporting greater financial security um, i'm proposing to just cover um, a little bit about coordination and implementation with an ask for you a brief update on improving mental health and then covering the other two priorities as well um, this was i uh, just because i'm aware it's been a long day <laughs> So a little opportunity for you to just bring someone to mind, either yourself or someone else, who you might have supported um, either in a personal or professional capacity when they were socially isolated and what it felt like and what other things came up. I'm not going to ask anyone to disclose that. Um, but uh, we found this exercise quite useful when we met in the social connections meeting, just to allow people to make a bit more of a personal connection to the issues we're talking about. Um, so hopefully you have someone in mind. Um, and I think the thing to bring out is that so often these issues intersect. Uh, we are um, currently overseeing an evaluation of welfare advice in health settings and looking at those case journeys. It's really clear that, that lots of people might start with a financial worry that leads to mental health issues and then uh, social connection issues or social isolation, as Judy just alluded to before. Um, so on overall coordination and implementation, we thought this was a good point to just pause and reflect. We're two years into the strategy um, and it's a good time to share progress and learning and continue to identify opportunities for collaboration. We've had an offer from the Local Government Association of some expert facilitation around this um, and they've actually identified some facilitators who I've listed here and put in the paper. They would um, be working with us till June. Um, and so I have an ask for them around the social connections work, around coordination between the three areas. But they've also offered to work with the Health and Wellbeing Board um, and offer a development session, which I know you, you took up this offer previously. So the purpose would be to enable leverage of the Health and Wellbeing Board as a strategic partnership, supporting the three health and wellbeing strategy priorities as well as a health and all policies approach, which I know we've spoken about before. The proposal is one-to-one -one interviews of about 40 minutes, which could be held online at Health and Wellbeing Board members' convenience, that then inform a development session, ideally held in person for about two hours. And I've included some objectives and anticipated outcomes in the paper, which hopefully you've all read, but they're here for you as well. So those are just making sure we're really owning the strategy priorities and supporting the implementation, defining the role of the board and relationship with wider partners. This came up in the previous item as well, particularly the place-based partnership and developing a way for the board to hold itself accountable, particularly on health and all policies. And the outcomes would be uh, as listed there um, and in the paper. Um, so an agreed vision for the board in relation to all of these, an agreed set of partnership principles, structures to support these, and a shared understanding of health and all policies and agreed way of ensuring accountability. So the ask is if you wanted to engage with this session and um, if you would like to agree the objectives and outcomes. So uh, happy to just pause briefly and, and take comments and 
uh, discussion on that would be useful to come to a consensus if we can. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm looking for hands up online or comments around the room. I thought they all looked uh, really sensible things for us to do. It's good practice for us to keep developing um, how we work. Um, we have regular health and care board development uh, sessions. Um, just about every other board I'm on um, works on its development, thinks about what it does, why it's doing it, um, and revisits its purpose and refreshes um, uh, itself, both in terms of membership and objectives. Um, so I would be taking that offer of help with both hands. Um, colleagues, I'm, I've got nods here. Can I see the odd thumbs up or thumbs down if you don't think it's a good idea online? Uh, Dublina? Uh, apologies, I wanted to do a thumbs up. Oh, I was just <laughs> doing a okay, I'm not managing the technology very well. <laughs> <laughs> very happy to support. Great, thank you. Um, thanks, Joy. I think we get back to them and we take that opportunity with um, uh, uh, both hands then. Thank you. Great. And just to reiterate, as you'll have seen, these are all uh, very senior facilitators who've all been part of strategic partnerships themselves, so um, have that background. Um, in terms of mental health, I'm not going to dwell on this much because we just brought a brief update this time as it was longer last time. There's a wide range of work underway. It's very welcome that this is part of the strategy um, and work is progress progressing on the on the needs assessment, uh, the joint part of the joint strategic needs assessment. And we'll bring that back next time we do an update. Thank you. On, on social connections, um, again, we've shared uh, since the last update, we actually have formed this group and it's been meeting regularly. Um, thank you for your help, Chair, Councillor Kennedy, in co-chairing that group with myself. Um, and we've put the objectives and linked the terms of reference here. Um, we also have a slide um, here on the membership. Um, one of the asks to you is to make sure that all health and wellbeing board organisations were asked to contribute um, a social connection lead to this group and not all organisations are represented at the moment. So we would be really grateful for a renewed effort around membership. We're very lucky to have um, officers such as Judy joining us as well to give valuable insight. Um, and we're also, we've got a couple of BCS reps as you can see, which is really important. And we've just recruited um, two more to join us as well. Um, so that's the first ask. We can come back to that at the end. Just to reiterate the approach, we've been really taking a strengths-based approach to understanding social connection, really learning from what's already been going on, um, and then showcasing best practice, and really trying to get those meetings as interactive and engaging as possible. Um, so to date, we've defined the objectives and tried to establish collective ownership. We've heard from lots of different organizations. We've looked at definitions, we've shared data and insight, um, and we've looked at the different factors um, that influence this, including evidence, policies, and frameworks. And the next steps really um, are to start thinking about action. So I share here one of the frameworks we looked at, which is the US Surgeon General's advisory um, on this issue. And we were looking at this and how could we hackify it. Um, and so uh, we're hoping to take advantage of that LGA offer to also help facilitate the next steps as we move to priorities for action. We hope to take a similar approach to the Health and Equality Steering Group, which has areas in which we can act, areas in which we can sort of sponsor or enable. So that's where other work is going on, but we can amplify it and then watch. So areas where there is already very good work going on and we just can just keep an eye on it. Um, we have managed to, uh, I've managed to squirrel away a little, very little pot. Um, which we might be able to put towards this because we don't currently have any funding. Um, and as I mentioned, we've got more reps coming in from the voluntary and community sector. Um, we've also looked at uh, what's already going on in terms of measurement so that we can leverage this, um, given that we don't have any funding around this. Um, and we're linking in with the Director of Public Health report on social capital. So the asks are, as I've said, 
uh, supporting renewed effort around membership and then um, the second ask I think will come more into the development session so really the ask is around the renewed effort uh, for membership so any reflections on that um, are welcome. Uh, thank you. Sorry, my my voice is giving us pauses. Um, does everybody's organisation have? Is is everyone confident you're sending someone to this group, please? The uh, Blina and the hospital. How often? Yeah. Someone from Homeless and Health. Um, I think it's Karen Kessek. She's uh, the deputy chief nurse for uh, our community division. Uh, Karen has been able to attend not all the sessions, but she has come. Yeah, she's on this list. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, uh, yes. Um, I have a comment that's kind of to the side of um, this, but I know that these groups normally have strategic staff in them, but I'm wondering whether more operational staff might be useful because I think social connections work is really about who people are, how they connect, how they deliver their work based on relationships, because that's where I think the biggest opportunity is if every health worker or housing officer who goes into someone's home, you know, is able to um, support the individual they're seeing with connections, um, then that's where we can make the most impact with statutory sector. And so I wonder if those types of um, roles might be able to, might be suitable. Shall I come back on that, Chair? Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, I think that's um, a really important point, Jess. The ask here was just to make sure that health and wellbeing boards are, are represented. But I think it is important, as you say, that we've got the right mix of people on that group. And, and we're, we're continuing to reflect on that. So thank you. Um, I think the Act Enable Watch principle um, is very good on this, but I am sure that interaction with the LGA um, advisors um, will enable us to shape um, this particular priority of the strategy um, uh, in a in a focused way that I think will will actually mean it it has some teeth. <laughs> Because at the moment it feels like we're we're very much in our uh, theoretical um, mode on it, and we want to, you know, really drill down into working working out how we really do the acting and the enabling um, bit of it, don't we? Agreed. Um, thank you. Um, let's move on and talk about the third and final priority: the financial inclusion, please. Yeah, Sonia, I made you a co-presenter, but I don't think you have a laptop, so I'll just move the slides on for you if you tell me. Okay, yeah, thanks. I was ready, but if you can do that. But actually, we've only got 10 minutes left, so I was going to just speak generally, I think, Joy, okay. on this, and then you've got the slide deck went yeah. out in the pack for, for, yeah. for the bit for this bit. So, um, so Jenny's also on the call, who's the strategic lead in the service, um, leading on on. On, on, on bringing everyone together around this um, and can pick up questions. But I think just the key points I want to make very briefly um, is that, that first of all, um, financial security and property reduction can't be addressed in a silo. They are complex issues and they have you know, a lot of interdependencies with, with other work. And obviously market is a big driver of, 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 of property in, in area like London, we've seen huge increase of property in, in work, people in work. So getting into work isn't a way out of poverty because of, of, of housing costs and because wages are, are being driven, driven down and often quite insecure as well. So the property reduction framework addresses all of these multiple factors, but at the same time, the focus of this um, update is on the first part of the framework, which is more about how we support residents with their immediate material needs, so more emergency, emergency help, but actually, there's nothing simple about that either, because 
if you just are looking at helping somebody to pay their bill or you're just getting the food offer you know as effective as possible reaching people who, who need it then that you're just doing that once and it's a sticking plaster and actually things that we could be doing in the wider system could easily interact with that and render that you know in, in one-off payment um meaning of any anyway so again even when we look at emergency health i think what, what's good in hackney is that we understand that that still needs to be looked at in a more complex complex way so what we're doing which the slides go into is we're bringing to light how we are um providing that support when people are in difficulty but recognizing that that's often you know that will be most likely coming from people having complex long-term issues um, and um, and so we need to avoid the sticking plaster and so we need approaches that will look at seeing that um, time when people are presenting for support as, as, as a time when you can kind of work out whether someone's got stuck in a system and is going around a revolving door um, or whether you know there's some indication of ongoing support that you can you can signpost people to. So it needs an approach that works at, at different levels. And that's what um the the, the, the slides focus on. Um, and they bring to life the you know the different ways that, that needs to happen. Um, and then um I just wanted to highlight that um that there's there's um, information in the slides about the budget that the council and health system has put towards this. And over time, as we've become more cognizant of these issues, more of the focus of the budget has gone into um, supporting like supporting um, collaboration and partnerships and making ma making um, making support work in the long term. But also in terms of money hubs work, um, focusing on income maximisation, so how you can support people to be able to get the benefits that they're entitled to. So again, it's about making sure that that resource has been directed towards some of that more um, immediate pre preventative preventative work. Obviously, alongside that, we've had the Household Support Fund, um, which has just been extended for, for six months. Um, and that is has had a requirement on it to be very much short term, short term um, support, immediate financial help, then the approach that we try to take is either to um, link it to a partner where they can actually, you know, someone um, is already in contact and needs that extra help and then is part of ongoing support or it's seen as that first presenting moment where somebody can be, can be, can, you know, they can be, then be um, supported in the, in the longer term. Um, and then the same with, with, with money habits. Yes, there's a distribution of funding that has to come but by locating it in, in Money Hub, there's an opportunity to link it more than to, to, to support. And, and the support has gone through both um, the uh, both through the Council's Money Hub and through voluntary and community sector giving grants um, and also through um, uh, professionals who are who, who, who are trusted partners. So it's been quite a complex distribution in order to make sure that we are maximizing that longer term, you know, that longer term benefit. But obviously, though, that's a live issue at the moment in terms of um, taking an approach that thinks about the end of housing and also universal credit migration um, is, is there's going to be groups who are um, who, who, who are going to migrate to universal credit. So in the next six months, making sure that we are we are, we are focused on, on, on them. And there are three questions for you. But I think the question that I would end on, given we've only got five minutes, yeah. is really about how um, we might, as a system, build that understanding of poverty reduction and what we can do that I've just played back. Because I think if as a system we can get better at understanding that this isn't a hand up, you know, that this is this is integral to community support, to statutory approaches, to frontline practice. Then we can get better in it and maybe you know i don't know how you're currently looking at development days and that sort of thing but just actually i think we could have a greater you know greater impact if there was that shared understanding that we've built over the last few years with a lot of partners but not necessarily um been able to um have held in the understanding at the system-wide level yeah I don't know. Know, yeah Jenny's on the call as well, and probably I'll bring her in for any questions. Um, uh, thank you, Sonia. Um, the the work that John from your team does um, about you know the tools for helping 
um, people is still attracting 50, 60 attendees from partner organizations across the borough every fortnight. Um, so there's a huge appetite out there to make sure that the system um, learns and understands from each other. And that's not, that's not just John talking about the money hub. It's all people from all parts of the system talking about what they're, they're doing. Um, and how, I suppose, uh, your question, Sonia, is um, is about how we how we we make we make sure that connections like that are permanently in place because it feels like we're going to need them for the medium to long term. Yeah, and they grew out of a short term. Yeah, and just get people out of the idea that this is something that is separate from supporting people who you know just that, that yeah i think the cost of living narrative has made people also think this is a short-term crisis whereas actually this has been building up over the last decade yeah. and if you look at housing over the you know decades so it's just yeah. getting into that yeah yeah and the structural things that contribute to it um aren't going to change anytime soon are they um uh, does it feel like there's, a, there's an action as a system or a, a conversation as a system that's missing? Maybe I can just bring Jenny. Jenny, does it? Yeah, I think um, my, my view on that, and I know it's something that um, we've been talking about as a kind of system-wide group um, across this work, is, is I suppose the need to look at the work on tackling inequalities in the round, because I think... Um, while this, there's a clear intersection with health inequalities, poverty also intersects with all of the other inequalities in Hackney that we're concerned about. And I think there's something about that system-wide understanding of the importance of, of the relational ways of working and, and the strengths-based approach that, you know, resonates across the mental health and the social connections work, um, but, but, but is clearly understood, I think, by frontline teams and services in terms of how it exacerbates <laughs> and uh you know all the other inequalities but not not so so well at the kind of system-wide um governance across this work so i think um there's there's a, a real i think things are um worsening um and i think there is a clear uh need for for more joined up working in this in this space given the complexity of need um across all of our frontline services and the likely pressure in the coming months um on, on all of our services uh, because of these uh, these impacts. Um, just just to uh, respond also to um, Councillor Kennedy's um, reminder about the tools for frontline staff session, um, that's actually happening at the same time as this, and I just joined uh, from there, and we heard from um, somebody in the long COVID service, which is a really key example, I think, of the way that the uh, the way that we've been dispersing the household support fund through some of our um, health partners as trusted referral partners has not only been um, helping those uh, patients with some crisis and emergency support, but also helping that service to really work in a much more joined up way across the system to support those residents with the, the complex health needs and a wider needs around housing and um, debt. Uh, and uh, and advocating even um, through kind of legal employment support. So I think um, there's there's huge amount um, that we can do in this space, but it really does require that joined up system wide approach and um, a proactive a proactive one at that. Thank you. It does. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, and and that's a salutary note um, on which to um, uh, propose that item. Um, I had one matter arising from our last meeting, which was. Um, we were going to get a more Hackney specific slide from uh, Amy Wilkinson um, to put into the North East London um, uh, ICS strategy. And actually, given some of the things we've talked about in our meeting today, um, we, want to be, uh, we want to be talking about um, our um, HIV sufferers who are getting older. Um, and we want to see that kind of detail um, in that slide, please. So can that come back to us? Mm -hmm. Um, our next meeting is uh, 27th of June. We haven't quite confirmed that yet. Oh, it has to go through the Council AGM. Yeah. So it probably is the 27th of June. Um, uh, thank you very much, um, everybody. Uh, sorry we've gone um, a minute over. Um, I'll see you in June, and I'll see many of you in other places before then. Thank you. Thanks, Chair.